Can robots reduce herbicide use on farms by up to 99%? Hello and welcome to Tech First. My name is John Gatsir. We know about laser powered weeders. I spoke to Carbon Robotics about their solution almost four years ago now. Now there's a robot that sprays both herbicide and fertilizer precisely in small aimed amounts, targeted amounts. It's called the sharpshooter. And the result says the company that makes it, Verdant Robotics, is to reduce chemical use by up to 99%. We're gonna chat with the CEO, Gabe Sibley. Welcome, Gabe, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, John. Thanks for having me on. Super pumped to talk. I, I love new tech, as you know. I love robotics, as you know. I love AI. And when you can bring that all together with farming, farm tech is super hot. It's really cool. And it's the basis of what keeps us alive. So it's kind of cool. Tell me about Sharpshooter. Yeah, so Sharpshooter is the only machine in the world that aims before it applies you know, inputs on target. So, you know, beneficials, crop protectorants, nutrients. So that means that the inputs land only where they need to be and, and nowhere else. So, you know, you can imagine putting a BB of crop protectorant up underneath a head of lettuce, parking a BB right on a style of an apple blossom as you're driving by at speed and putting a different BB on the lateral leaves on a apple cluster as opposed to the one in the middle or parking a, a BB right between carrots that are less than an inch apart and not hitting the carrots. So it's aiming and using a bunch of robotics and computer vision and machine learning to do that while ripping through the field at speed. Amazing. Like aimable machine squirt gun. <laughs> we all know that there's, there's a lot of things going on here, right? First of all, herbicides are expensive. Everything is ex everything's getting more and more expensive. And, and, and fertilizer is expensive as well. So you want to use as little as you can, as, as you can from that point of view. Also, you know that if you're killing stuff on your field that you don't want, that has long-term negative impacts on soil quality as well. So you want to use as little as possible. So that's, that's huge. That's, that's a really, really big factor. Speed is also a big factor. You've got, especially here in the U.S., massive field, biggest fields in the world, maybe. You know, how fast is this thing? So our current machine, the vision system can go up to five miles an hour and depending on weed density, it can go that fast and really depends on what's in the field. Mm -hmm. It takes around 240 shots per second. So those aimable turrets and you can always add more turrets to go faster. <laughs> 240 shots per second. Wow. Talk about savings for farmers. I mentioned the cost of stuff. I mean, potash is one thing, right? Key component, fertilizer. 90% of American supply comes from Canada. There's tariffs on it now. I've seen farmers' stories. Their, 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 their shipment came in, and now there's extra cost, and they weren't anticipating that, and now they're worrying about going broke. When you can precision apply the things you want to put on your field, what are the savings? Yeah, so there's really two savings. You've got savings on sort of the labor availability side and on the input side, the cost of you know, fertilizer. Fertilizer went up 300% when the war in Ukraine started. And growers spend, the vast majority of their spend is on those two. You know, 60 to 70% of the cost in ag are bound up in those two. And that's really why we started the business. My co-founder is a farmer and the farm he was working on saw their prices doubling and it was completely not sustainable. And so there clearly had to be a solution. And it's fantastic that when you use material so much more sparingly, mm -hmm. it's also not just good for the farmer's pocketbook. It's good for the health of the plant. It's good for the health of the soil and the runoff, the water, the food we eat. It's really beneficial all the way around. And it's sort of the definition of efficiency. You know, you get more with less. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, it's just a fantastic leverage on technology it's what the tech is a tool there to help out right that's got to be so much more efficient in usage of whether it's a herbicide or whether it's something that's beneficial to the plant as well i mean you you would have to think the old method of just spraying the entire world of your farm with whatever you're spraying half of that or more is going to be gone on the next rain right yeah you know there's all sorts of beneficial things that we apply i mean fertilizer and things like pollen and other nutrients and today they're they're wasted right they don't go where they need to be mm -hmm. uh, but that's actually how we give plants you know the stuff we eat the lettuce we love that's how it gets the nutrients it needs so why waste it where it doesn't need to be especially if there's detrimental impact to doing that mm -hmm. um, so again yeah save a bunch more and use it more sparingly don't need to push volume when you can get better outcomes with less. Cool. 
Let's talk about the tech a little bit. It comes as an attachment to a tractor, and that's quite interesting. You and I, as we were chatting and just prepping for this, we were talking a little bit about Clarkson's Farm. I've been into that a little bit because I've been in the whole Top Gear and Grand Tour type stuff from Jeremy Clarkson. And, you know, I, I didn't know a lot about farming equipment and everything but the number of things you got to attach to a tractor is pretty impressive you've designed it as an attachment tra to a tractor which seems to like fit how farmers think about new equipment is that correct yeah that's right you've got to have a product that fits in with the way they work today that's got to be able to clip on to a three-point hitch hook up to hydraulic or however you're going to attach it at a moment's notice and drop the next moment because they're going to change to a different tool you know those tractors are transformers and we're one of the implements that they're going to use so let's talk about what's on board then. You talked about AI. I assume you've got some cameras. There's clearly some, some, some lighting that you do as well. What tech did you build into this thing? You know, our background is in robotics, you know, so perception systems for autonomous mobile robots, both from the control side, but also the perception side. So there's absolute state of the art, visual inertial scene understanding pipeline that's running in every single one of our, you know, what we very cleverly call spray boxes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's a couple of cameras that look at the ground, they make sense of it at very high speed in terms of its 3D structure, sort of the, the where problem, where is it at? And at like multiple hundred frames per second, where am I in relationship to that three dimensional structure? And then that feeds into the, you know, control systems that are aiming and targeting at actually like many kilohertz fast control loops so that we can make sure that those molecules land just where they need to be and nowhere else. So it really is like a, a full blown robotics problem, even though we're not doing the autonomous navigation component, which mm -hmm. my team has done many times, but that's just not where you want to get started. <laughs> You must also have some image recognition that happens at very fast speed. So you know that this is a plant, that's a weed. This is what we want. This is what we don't want. Those sorts of things. Yeah. I mean, machine learning has touched everything at this point, including sort of spatial AI, but also sort of semantic side of it. You know, the what problem, what am I looking at? Where is it? And what is it? Mm -hmm. What genealogical state is its development? Uh, mm -hmm. Is it a different type of soil, a different type of weed? What type of weed? You know, what type of plant is it? Where do I want to spray on that plant? So things like, you know, detection, localization, segmentation, all of that's done with machine learning these days and increasingly machine learning that uh, leverages all of the multimodal foundation models and cooler techniques that are coming out. Really pretty impressive what we've been able to do with that technology. It's, it's touching everything, including ag. Mm-hmm. You must have some serious hardware that you're packing on there in terms of either CPU or GPU or both. Because like if I take a picture of something with my iPhone, which is the latest Pro Max version, so it's got a pretty beefy processor on there. And I say, what is this flower? It takes a little bit of time. It's not instant. But you're trundling along here at five miles an hour and you're looking at me, you know, let's say, I don't know how many you're passing in any, any given second, but it's more than... It's probably a hundred or something like that. You got to look at a lot of different things, instantly know what they are. And then am I going to target that? Am I not going to target that? If I'm going to target that, what am I going to target that with? There's a lot of work to do here. Yeah. I mean, Moore's law is our friend and it's so lovely, right? We have so much computational power at our fingertips, you know, increasingly right down into our cell phones. So all of these modern systems have vision processing pipelines, machine learning pipelines that can do inference on the edge at incredibly high speeds. You know, whether that's an NVIDIA part, uh, an Apple part, a uh, Qualcomm part, it's really interesting. I've always found this kind of fascinating. You know, 50% of the neurons in our body are dedicated to processing visual stimulus. Mm -hmm. And the machines that we have built, 50% of the transistors are dedicated to either understanding or processing images get out of here that yeah, is cool. kind of wild i mean it makes sense they're kind of co-evolved to fit us <laughs> interesting interesting wow okay cool so you're recognizing everything. you're not you know phoning up to the cloud to ask chat gpt what a thing is huh can't do it decisions gotta happen in real time and you know when we got started starlink wasn't here and so you need to be able to operate independently all that autonomy has to be baked in all that decision making has to be baked in yeah. certainly having a nice pipe to the cloud helps with telemetry, helps with doing, you know, OTA updates, but you don't, you don't have that capability everywhere in the world, at least until recently you didn't have it. 
One of the things I've learned from Clarkson's farms, you got to be a freaking engineer to run any equipment on your on your on your bloody farm because the tractor has like fifty thousand buttons, especially if you buy a Lamborghini, which I assume not many American farmers have done, and not many British farmers have done, maybe not others as well. But I mean, there's so much complexity there. Tell me, this thing is easy to use. It's kind of wild. So we used to run this thing with, you know, Linux boxes in the cab in the super early days. And ultimately, we could still train people to use it. But at this point, you know, it's got a polished user interface and, you know, red light, green light, turn it on and go, make it super easy to use. Provide growers with enough control because they definitely want to tune it for their mm -hmm. settings uh, mm -hmm. so that they can really fine tune it as they wish. But mm -hmm. it's got to be super easy to use. It's actually really wonderful. You can walk behind the tractor, you know, hundreds of feet away and look at the user interface, see the images streaming by, see how it's performing. And it's just really easy. Yeah. We, we had to do that, right? I mean, absolutely. You mentioned autonomy was a thing that you worked on in the past, didn't want to do here. It makes sense. It attaches to the tractor. I'm assuming all the tractor manufacturers are working that as well. You see, you know, they've certainly got features for low level autonomy, and I'm sure they're building up to higher and higher levels. Is that correct? Absolutely. You know, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, I don't know. Some point in the future, we'll look back. And I'll tell you what we won't say. We won't say, hey, do you remember when we automated agriculture? We're going to talk about automating agriculture and construction and forestry and logistics. And we're really in the process of automating physical work. Mm -hmm. uh, it just so happens that doing it in agriculture is tractable. You can bring value to the customer now. Mm -hmm. And so it's absolutely happening now. It, it brings real value. Cool. Cool. You had a million things you could pick when you were working on thinking about, hey, what's my next venture going to be? What's my next company going to be? What am I going to focus my life on? You happen to pick farm tech. How come? Was there any personal connection? I mean, I grew up outside in the country, more at ranch and mining country. And so there's definitely speaks to me. And also, you know, I'm an outdoorsman. I love skiing and biking. Being outside is important to me. So I really love that I get to work outside as opposed to, you know, uh, getting the electron glow of a screen in the basement somewhere. <laughs> and, you know, 25 years ago, robotics was a much smaller community. And, yeah. you know, it was mostly space and military applications. The whole self-driving car thing came along. And that's what pulled me out of the science lab and into industry. It's taken a long time for that to come to fruition, which is why I left that. Mm -hmm. And it was a, an adventure to find how my life's work around long-term autonomous robotics, mobile robotics could bring value more broadly as measured by people willing to part with money to, to pay for it. If you can do that at scale, you're, you're doing something that's really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel so fortunate to have found agriculture. And, you know, it speaks to me more broadly just as somebody who appreciates the outdoors and obviously food and growing it in a healthy way <laughs> and like the eggs on and the dirt, right? It's good. <laughs> and I was super fortunate to meet my co-founder. So he's, he's better half of the business, right? He's the farmer in the business. He's the, the ag DNA. And also at that point to understand the scale of the challenges that we face in ag, they're very real and they're totally global. Mm -hmm. We have to figure out how to grow a lot more food sustainably. And it's, it's the food we eat, right? Like we're focused on the good fruits and veg that's for human consumption. So we want it to be super healthy and efficiently produced. So, you know, I like to say ag is 5% of world GDP, but it's 100% of our calories, right? It's not going anywhere. It's big, it's important. And so by doing it super efficiently, you're doing something really good and it's fulfilling. It's really, it marriages, marries Ag marries like my my love for the hard technology problems, mm -hmm. scratches mm -hmm. that intellectual itch with a much broader mission. And that's actually, I think, true for most of the folks here at the business. And that's why I've been able to recruit such top-notch people because it's the whole ball of wax. Um, mm -hmm. It's really mission-driven. It's, it's a lot of fun. Hard and, you know, and it's hard, so it better be fun because it's got to have something to get out of bed for in the morning when it's super hard. Hard technology problems is accurate. I mean, not only are the challenges hard, but I mean, the, the the conditions under which your technology will be used are hard. Any kind of weather, lots of jostling around, dirt, mud, everything, right? You name it, it's all going to be there and it's got to work. It is super interesting if you look at farming and the amount of technology that's being applied there. It's really, really cool. We see vertical farms on the one hand. We all see all kinds of automation and tools. And on the, on the other hand, flat farms are always going to be a part of what we do as well, a big part of what we do. But it's really interesting to see as well that farmers are, are, are really diversifying their crops as well. 
as different crops have different value, you know, they're not just doing 5,000 acres of wheat, right? They're looking at different crops and everything like that. The interesting thing with technology like this is you can deal with diversity. It's not just, you know, one massive tractor pulling one dumb piece of equipment, doing the same thing everywhere. You can specify what's going on in different areas. You know, absolutely. Some of the largest organic growers in the world have a deep interest in things like intercropping and row cropping, you know, regenerative farming techniques. Now, we've been doing monocropping for a long time because that's how we achieve scale, which is important. Mm. That's how we feed the world. But there are a whole variety of other technologies that, that unlock kind of older farming techniques that can keep soils healthy, not require as much nutrients to be pushed into the ground. So save a budget there, mm-hmm. uh, but also really keep soil very, very healthy and still be very productive. But now you've got to have a machine that can be specific down at the plant level, not just monocropping and scale at the same time. And so it's really that specificity together with scaling. So operating across those broad scales from tiny to huge that computation and robotics, you know, seeing and understanding unlock. It's, yeah. I think, really an interesting future path. Super cool. It, it's amazing and it's cool and it's super necessary because farming is challenging. It's difficult. It's dangerous. It's expensive. It's not always remunerative either, as we've seen, right? So we need ways of doing it that help out in all those directions. Hey, thanks so much for this time. Really do appreciate it. Yeah, thanks a lot, John. Good to talk to you.